All in the lovely and precious name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. It's good to be found in his presence tonight. Amen. 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 I just want to welcome all the visitors into the presence of God. Just want to say you feel welcome where you, wherever you sit. Amen. No one's going to stop you if you want to dance or shout or say amen. Amen. We just want to welcome Brother Henry Ratif, Brother Valdo Ratif, Sister Linda Moritz, Brother Terence Bailey, and Brother George Mark and his wife. Amen. Feel, pre feel free in the presence of God. Amen. Can the Eagle Ministry Tabernacle members just give them a round of applause? Amen. <laughs> Just for you all to feel free in the presence, amen. Let us all just rise up to our feet as we get, us get ready for the word of God, for the song service, amen. Let's sing that song, amen. Oh, come, let us adore him. That's what we've come here tonight to do, amen. Just to come to adore and worship him tonight. Oh, come, let us adore him. Oh, come, let us adore Father, we come into your presence, O oh Lord. 
And Father, we can say it like how the songwriter wrote it. Father, we have come to give you all the glory because in you there's no failure. And Lord, we'll just want to give you and sing all the glory to you tonight, oh Father. Why? Because you deserve all the glory and all the honor and all the praises that our mortal bodies can give, oh Father. Oh Lord, we just want to bring our lives totally under subjection to you this, to this night, oh Father. Lord, we want to say, oh Lord, just come and reign upon the service, oh Father. Come and move from pillar to post this evening oh lord jesus help each and every one of us oh lord that is bowed in your presence right now oh father oh lord just to feel free in your spirit oh lord and make a joyful noise unto the lord we just want to say oh lord thank you oh father for making the time of your busy schedule oh lord just to come and meet with us tonight father we appreciate you and say oh lord how much we love you oh father and how much we appreciate you thank you oh lord Oh, come, oh, come, let us adore him. Oh, come, let us adore him. Oh, come, let us adore him. Christ, the Lord will give him all the glory. the glory tonight. Amen. amen. You may take your seats. Amen. I'm just going to ask one of the brothers to take the offering bag around. As we sing that song, amen, a higher ground, I'm pressing on the upward way. I'm pressing on the upward way. New heights I'm gaining. Every day still pray. Some may dwell, though some may dwell where these is abound. My prayer, my prayer, my aim is higher ground. So, Lord, lift me up. I want to scale the 
most heights, the most heights, and catch a gleam, catch a gleam of glory bright. But still I'll pray till heaven I found, till heaven I found. Lord, lead me on, Lord, lead me on to higher ground. So Lord, lift me up, Lord, lift me up. tonight that God will lift us out of this state and plant our feet on higher ground. Amen. Amen. You may just rise up to your feet. Let's sing another song. I will enter his gates with thanksgiving. Amen. I will enter his gates with thanksgiving in my heart. Now I will enter his courts with praise. I will say I will I will enter, oh, and I will enter his gates with thanksgiving in my heart. I will enter his courts with praise. I will say this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. Amen. He has made me tonight. Amen. We just want to open this meeting in a word of prayer. I'm going to ask our brother Terence really to come and just open this meeting in a word of prayer. We have a couple of prayer requests here. The first one is from Sister Sis from Brother Jenkins. It says that Sister Siska is not well in the body and needs prayer from, from the saints to the Lord. Amen. For complete healing in her life. Amen. And we also have Sister Chantel. Brother Donald told us that not much improvement has happened. She's still in a lot of pain, and they cannot explain why, and medication is not helping. So we still need to pray for Sister Chantal. And also we want to remember Sister Yulandi's brother, who also needs a healing touch from the Lord. Amen. Tonight uh, for the, 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 the operation on his foot. Amen. And also remember myself in prayer. I have one unspoken prayer request that is known unto God, and another of sickness as well. There's just up and down flu and nothing seems to be working and nothing seems to be helping. Amen. But I know that God will help. Amen. 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 Dear gracious, almighty, heavenly Father, once again, Lord, we 
approach your throne of grace and mercy through the precious blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, this evening. Appreciate the, your loving kindness towards us in this hour, Lord, your grace and your mercy that you've bestowed upon us in this late hour. Lord, we realize, Lord, and we can't thank you enough for a message that has come our way. Lord, a prophet, a vindicated prophet that you've sent, Lord, to show us the way, Lord, we appreciate that ministry and we realize, Lord, it's our contact with you in this hour through that message, through that word, Lord. Lord, as we approach you once again, we believe that you are still the healer, Lord. We stand as a testimony to you that you've healed cancer even in my own body, Lord. And I know without a shadow of a doubt, whatever we have and whatever problems you ha we have, Lord, you are more than able to undertake for us. Lord, we have so much confidence in this word, in this hour. Lord, there's just no doubt in us, Lord, that we know, that we just know, that we know, Lord. And we come to you, Lord, not because of our works or what we've done, but through the precious blood of Jesus Christ that saved us. We ask that you forgive us of our sins, Lord. Undertake for each brother and sister, each need that was mentioned, each request, Lord. Lord, won't you touch the hearts of each individual in a special way tonight? pray that you bless Brother Chris, Lord, especially. Lord, we, we're looking forward to that word that is going to come, Lord. We pray that we have receptive hearts, that we may hear your word, Lord, and not only be hearers, but doers of that word. Lord, bless everything, the, the, the songs and the preaching and the prayers and everything tonight, Lord. Pray that you bless us for the very special blessing as I pray in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen still in the same attitude of prayer let's sing that song when peace like a river attended my way amen it is well with my soul <clears throat> when peace like a river attended my way when sorrows when so to the 
cross now meeting to our precious pastor to take over and when let's sing that song my life is in your hands you don't have to worry and don't you feel ashamed for joy comes in the morning and troubles they don't last always amen oh you don't have to worry and don't you be afraid for joy joy comes in the morning troubles they Troubles they don't last away For there's a friend For there's a friend in Jesus Who will wipe, who will wipe your tears away And if your heart, and if your heart is broken Just lift, just lift your hands and say
troubles they don't last always for there's a friend for there's a friend in Jesus who will wipe who will wipe your tears away and if your heart and if your heart is broke just lift your hands now who oh, just lift your hands and say Aren't we are lucky people tonight to be able to sing that? Amen. And not just sing it, but also believe it. Amen. Because our, our lives are a reflection of it. And we know that we can make it because we've got Jesus on our side. Amen. Are you excited tonight for the word? Amen. Amen. I'm also excited. But, um, you know, before I introduce Brother Chris, I said to him, Brother Chris, you know, on a Wednesday night, we, we, we've got a prayer meeting. And if you don't mind, we just, we usually take 10 minutes just to uh, make our chairs, our altar, and uh, and, you know, I, I don't want to break the, 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 the Wednesday night thing that we do. So uh, he said, well, brother, you just do what, whatever is necessary to do. So we want to honor that uh, still tonight and give you an opportunity just to make your, your chair, your altar tonight. And um, just go down on your knees. Remember the needs that you have. Remember one another in prayer. Remember the bride of Jesus Christ around the world. Amen. Remember Brother Chris and his church and also the believers on that side. Amen. And... Um, just remember one another in prayer. That's the most important thing. There's a lot going on, and we need the Lord in this hour. Amen. So let's just take some time and just make your chair and altar. Amen. Before the Lord tonight. Amen.
like to greet you all in the precious name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. And uh, you know, I would really have wanted to just give Brother Chris all the time tonight, but you know, like we always say, a church that prays together stays together. Mm -hmm. Amen. And that's why we just want to honor the Lord tonight. I don't think Brother Chris needs any introduction, but for those of you who don't know him, Brother Chris is from Canada. And he's, um, you know, it's been my heart's desire and a prayer for, for many, many, uh, many, many a weeks and many, many a months. Uh, for me to go to Brother Chris or Brother Chris to come here. And we know that it's not under the best of conditions that he is here, but, you know, it's just like the Lord still answers prayers, brothers and sisters. Amen. We have so much in common. Um, I can actually see, I, I just have always honored him as an, as an older brother, uh, just because of the history and, um, you know, um, just uh, Sister Linda and Brother Paul that's been friends with my parents for many, many years. And, um, you know, we've just known each other, but distance has, has, has been a challenge, obviously. Um, but uh, we have uh, similarities in the ministry, and, we, and we've, uh, we've had the honor of, of being together when... Um, uh, Brother Chris, I don't hope you, you mind this, brother. I don't know if you wanted to say this, but many years ago at a youth camp, Brother Willie uh, actually invited Brother Chris to come and preach. And Brother Chris uh, was hesitant, and he was sitting in the back room, and um, he prayed to the Lord. He said, Lord, if you want me to start a ministry, then the brother that's song leading will sing, Welcome, Welcome, Holy Ghost, we welcome thee. And what, what Brother Chris didn't know is was that at that youth camp, I was the song leader. And I said, now we're going to welcome Brother Chris. And as he comes up, let's sing the song, Welcome, Welcome, Holy Spirit, Holy Ghost, we welcome thee. And that was just Brother Chris's confirmation that he needed to be in the ministry at the time. And from there on, the Lord just blessed him so you know, it's a, it's a great bond that we share. And after that, other things happened on other youth camps that he came to visit. So we just thank the Lord. I mean, he still works in our midst, brothers and sisters. And tonight, my prayer is that the Lord will bless you with the word, with the word and with the things that will be said here tonight. So we welcome all the visitors that's amongst us. And uh, we just pray that the Lord will give Brother Chris liberty to speak. Amen. Maybe we can stand tonight as we sing that song. <clears throat> in moments like these, I sing a love song. In moments like these, I lift up my hands. Amen. In moments like these, I sing a love song. Oh, sing a love song unto Jesus. In moments like these, I sing.
lift up my hands to the Lord. Singing, I love him. Singing, I Amen. It's good to be in the house of the Lord this evening. No place I'd rather be than to be in His presence. And uh, our brother Devet has been very kind, and I'm humbled to be standing here this evening. You know, I don't. Uh, I, I felt a little funny when he said I'm from Canada. I mean, that's not entirely true. I, I feel like I want to just correct that, brother Devet. <laughs> I'm from here. You know, I remember running down the the, the red sand streets. You know, and and in our bare feet and speaking Afrikaans and you know so this is I felt right at home when I when the plane landed and and uh, there's still a part of me that calls us home and so I guess uh, we won't preach in Afrikaans that would take too long I would need an interpreter but um, no it's, it just is a ple- pleasure to be here we bring you greetings from the saints in Canada a uh, little church there uh, Living Word Fellowship and um, just an extension of the, of the family of God. Amen. And so it, it's an honor to be here with you tonight. And we just trust we'll be a blessing. Amen. It's not, a, it's not about who's standing behind the desk tonight. It's about who is here in our midst. Amen. And, you know, he can take my words and he can order them just the right way so that you uh, receive a blessing from it. So just um, don't look at the veil this evening, but look to him tonight. Amen. Because he holds the answers he holds everything we have need of tonight. So we're going to turn in our Bibles right away to the book of Mark, chapter 5, and verse 21. Thank you, musicians. Enjoyed the song service tonight. Amen. That song uh, rings so true in our hearts this evening. I love him. Amen. Amen. If we look at all the things that God has done for us and, and how he has watched over us and he's protected us and guided us. And as our brother Devet was talking, you know, about, uh, I think it was 2009, brother Devet that uh, we were there, and I remember being in that back study, and, and, I, and I had my notes all in array because, you know, I was thinking, uh, you know, the thought came to me that, you know, how dare I go up behind that pulpit? You know, that's a sacred place. And even at a youth meeting like that, I just didn't feel uh, right to be behind that desk, you know, without, without knowing from the Lord that, it, that he was okay with it, you know? And I uh, just felt to, uh, at that moment, I started looking at my notes, and my notes, you know, I started to realize, you know, no one showed me how to do this, you know. There's no training or school that we went to, so, you know, I started questioning even my layout, and I started mixing things up, started scribbling other things in there, and before I know it, I had this big mess, and so I decided, I said, let me ask him. Let me ask him what he thinks, and uh, I just decided, Lord, I'm, I'm going to put a fleece out tonight. I've never done that before, or this morning, I believe it was. And I wrote on the top left-hand corner of my paper there, Welcome, welcome, Holy Ghost, we welcome thee. Still have those notes to this day, Brother Devet. And uh, yeah, and the rest is history. The Lord answered the fleece and in a supernatural way. And uh, I believe you said that after the meeting, I caught up to you and I told you about my experience. And you said something like, you put a fleece out, that if, you, if something supernatural happened in the song service, that, the, that you knew something was happening in your life. So, you know, the Lord uh, gave us a little connection there, and uh, I just feel really honored to be standing here so many years later, 14 years later, and it's, uh, it's quite something. Amen. You know, there's uh, been some great warriors who have gone before us, and, and they've been laid to rest, and the baton and the sword has been handed over to the next generation, and here we are, you know, and so it's quite an era that we're living in. It's quite a time. It's quite a season. It's an exciting time, you know, because we know that God is in control and he knows just how to move the pieces on the board and he knows exactly what he needs done. And so we want to just continue to yield ourselves to him. And, you know, that's not just ministry, but that's all of us be yielding ourselves to the Lord and say, Lord, what is what do you want us to do next? What is the direction we're going and and set us on fire? Lord, draw us near unto you. Amen. So 
Tonight we just want to take a little bit of a story here, being it Wednesday night, and I thought we would just encourage you in the story of Mark chapter 5, that's the story of, of Jairus' daughter, and, um, and I just thought, you know, when I was reading the story, that there's so much to glean from it, and I want to just share some of these things that the Lord put on my heart, and just to show how personal God is, that God understands each and every one, and, and while he may be dealing with someone over here, he knows about this one's need, and just how, how God is all-knowing, and, and his eye doesn't miss a thing. You might feel like, Lord, what about my prayer? What about the promise you gave me? And what about my family? Well, the Lord knows. He knows about all those things, and I'm excited about that because I've seen him move. I've seen him change lives and bring people back to the house of the Lord and, and reconnect uh, uh, families and all these things. So we know God is, is the God of the impossible. Amen? Yeah. So Mark chapter 5, which would be the grace chapter of Mark, it says, um, well, it's a lengthy reading. I'm going to read just a couple of verses maybe with you, and then we'll let you have your seats. It says, uh, and when Jesus was passed over again by ship unto the other side, much people gathered unto him, and he was nigh unto the sea. And behold, there cometh one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus, by name. And when he saw him, he fell at his feet. We'll read this next one together. And besought him greatly, saying, My little daughter lieth at the point of death. I pray thee, come and lay thy hands on her, that she may be healed and she shall live. This is bow our heads one more time. Our precious Heavenly Father, we stand humbly before you this evening, knowing, Lord, that there's nothing in ourselves that we can bring. But, Lord, we bring our loaves and fishes tonight, asking that you would pour in the increase, you would multiply it, so that it can bring substance to our souls, Lord, that it can bring encouragement, Lord, and instruction to our lives and our walks with you, Father. So bless us tonight, Lord, and we welcome you, Father, now, and, Lord, as we are reading your word, Father, that you would come, Lord, that you would bring revelation Lord, that you would open our minds and our hearts, Lord, that you would cause a revival within us. Lord, that you would encourage us in the Word tonight, Lord. That is our prayer, Lord, and we want to just commit this service now into your hands. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. You may have your seats. We're going to just read the rest of the story, and um, so you can follow along with me in your Bibles there. Just so we get an overview of the whole story. And then what I want to do is start uh, highlighting some of the things throughout the story. In verse 24, he goes on, And Jesus went with him, and much people followed him and thronged him. And now we see another lady enter the scene. So we've seen Jairus there. We see the crowds. We see Jesus. And we see the little daughter. Remember, the title of the sermon tonight is The Two Daughters. And so here we see now a certain woman which had an issue of blood 12 years and had suffered many things of many physicians and had spent all that she had and, had and was nothing better but rather grew worse. And when she heard of Jesus, came in, came in the press behind and touched his garment. For she said, if I may touch but his clothes, I shall be whole. And straightway the fountain of her blood was dried up and she felt in her body that she was healed of that plague. And Jesus, immediately knowing in himself that virtue had gone out of him, he turned him about in the press and said, Who touched my clothes? And his disciples said unto him, Thou seest the multitude thronging thee, and sayest thou, Who touches me? And he looked around about to see her that had, touched, had done this thing. But the woman, fearing and trembling, knowing what was done in her, came and fell down before him and told him all the truth. And he said unto her, Daughter, thy faith hath made thee whole. Go in peace and be whole of thy plague. While he yet spake, there came from the ruler of the synagogue's house certain which said, the, Thy daughter is dead. Why troublest thou the master any further? As soon as Jesus heard the word that was spoken, he said unto the ruler of the synagogue, Be not afraid, only believe. Amen. Amen? And he suffered no man to follow him, save Peter, James, and John, the brother of James, and he cometh to the house of the ruler of the synagogue and seeth a tumult, and them that wept and wailed greatly. And when he was come in, he said unto her, Why make you this ado, and weep? And the damsel is not dead, but sleepeth. And they laughed him to scorn. But when he had put them all out, he taketh the father and the mother of the damsel and them that were with him, and entered in where the damsel was lying. And he took the damsel by the hand and said unto her, Talitha, 
kami, which is being interpreted, damsel, I say unto thee, arise. And straightway the damsel arose and walked, for she was of the age of 12 years. And they were astonished with great astonishment. And he charged them straightly that no man should know it, and commanded them that something should be given her to eat. Amen. So now you've heard the whole story, the whole sermon in, an, in about five minutes. So if you want to now take your nap, you're allowed to do so, or if you need to go home. So that is essentially the sermon tonight. But what I would like to do now for those of us who want to dig a little deeper, I want to look at the story because I, be, I believe God, when He does things and, and He goes through these actions and motions and He allows events to unfold, He's doing them for a reason. And there's things in there that when we read it, we go, yes, Lord, that's me. That's me in the Word, and I see myself in the situation, or, or you, you glean something from it that encourages you. So the Lord knew 2,000 years later, we'd be sitting here tonight, and we'd be reading the story, amen, and we'd be gleaning something from it. So those things didn't just happen back there, but God allowed those things to take place, setting a pattern in the earth and having it written in His Bible, because it was going to be a bride at the end time who would be living in these kinds of conditions, that would have these kinds of needs, and we would be encouraged in the Word tonight. Amen. So we see how God is, is awesome. He's big. He's all-seeing. He knows all things. Amen. And he, and he has ordered our footsteps. He knew exactly who would be sitting here tonight. He knew who would be the pastor here this evening. He knew who would be attending the service tonight. He knows, he knows everything about us. Amen. So, and I want to just glean a little bit from the story to show you how attentive he was to these different individuals. So we see the setting here in the beginning it is it's saying that he came across the sea, which is to come back into Cap Capernaum, which is a great time of signs and wonders and miracles. So here coming into Capernaum, we see all these great events happening. You know, there was a great attraction trying to get the people to realize who this was walking in their midst. That this was just not an ordinary man. He was not just a prophet. It was God who was on the scene. It was God, who, who their creator, their maker, who was walking in their midst. Amen? I love that because John turns around to see the voice who was talking to him. What does he see? One like the, unto the Son of Man, walking in the midst of the candlesticks, which would be the bride. Amen? Amen? So here we see God is in their midst, and wherever God is, there's signs, and there's wonders, and there's miracles, and this, that would be the same here tonight, because wherever two or three are gathered in His name, Amen. there I am in their midst. Amen? Amen? So God is here. Don't miss Him tonight. Amen. So just before this, Jesus was telling the parable of the mustard seed faith, just that little mustard seed faith. That's all you need tonight. If you feel like, Brother Chris, you know what, I appreciate you coming, but you know what, I've been at work all day, I'm tired you know, and I'm thinking about work tomorrow. There's not a lot, whole lot that I can offer. I'm talking about a mustard seed faith. Just a, just a little handful. If you've got just a little grain tonight, it's enough. Amen. Jesus Christ is talking about that mustard grain, that mustard seed of faith. And then he says, Jesus calms the storms by speaking to it. So we see the setting. And people are obviously in this crowd and they're talking about what had just maybe happened. There was a storm and... And how that the storm was gone all of a sudden. And here's the one that all of nature listens to. All of nature is subject to. You know? Amen. He's the one that was walking into the scene in Capernaum. Jesus calming the storm by just speaking to it. Showing his authority over nature. Jesus casts out the devils of the maniac of Gadara. Showing his power over evil. So this was quite someone coming on the scene here in this day. Jesus was passed over again by ship onto the other side. I'm so glad he came back by ship, amen, over to the other side where there was two more needs. So Jesus coming again to a place called Capernaum, this place became home to him. It was like a base camp, if you want to call it that. <coughs> Excuse me. So across the sea again to be in this place which would be considered Gentile territory. So here he has moved now and he's crossed over this, this divide and he's dealing with a Gentile area. So just want to set a scene for you for what, what is happening here in the story. God, I believe, is showing us something about what is happening in our day. See, it was in Capernaum that that centurion came to him, which was a sign of the Gentile faith. You remember the story? This time when he comes to Capernaum, he deals with two women. 
Remember, he's dealing with the Jews, and then he's dealing with the Gentiles. He's dealing with two women. Amen? One for healing and one for resurrection. <clears throat> Capernaum has a compound significance because it points to the end time also. Not just Capernaum back there, but pointing prophetically to our day. Matthew eleven twenty three. 23, if you want to turn there. <coughs> You'll have to excuse my voice tonight. A little out of practice. <laughs> Matthew eleven twenty three, well-known scripture says, And thou, Capernaum, which art exalted unto heaven, shall be brought down to hell. For if the mighty works which had been done in thee had been done in Sodom, it would have, been, it would have remained until this day. But I say unto you that it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for thee. So this is the prophecy given of Capernaum. So we see that Capernaum has something to do with today also. Not just the Capernaum of that day. But he's pointing to a spirit or a city with the characteristics of that city in our day. <clears throat> that Capernaum, by the way, is at the bottom of the sea today. In the message, uh, greater than Solomon is here. The prophet says, O thou Capernaum, thou art exalted into heaven because you think you have the best synagogues. All those swell ministers and everything. And you're very religious. Very religious, right? You're so swelled up and you're so pious till you are exalted into heaven. But I say unto thee, thou shalt be cast down into hell. Where is Capernaum today? It is at the bottom of the Dead Sea. Every city that received Jesus, they are standing today. Think about it. Just like Jerusalem is standing there today. God has reserved them, amen, for, for his purpose. But look at this. He says, at the bottom of the Dead Sea, every city that received him, they stand today. And every city that he cursed is gone today. Sure, he was more than a prophet. He was God manifested in the flesh. And notice he goes back into the scriptures to begin to show, as I wish to, in the next 15 minutes, he says, that in all the ages, God has always had his people and had the supernatural working in all the ages. When God sends a gift to the earth, if that generation receives that, that gift, then they become a blessed people. And if they turn it down, they become a cursed people. Always been that way. Look at that generation in Jesus' day. God sent the greatest gift that was ever sent to that generation. That's what he said. There's a greater than Solomon here. And they turned him down and called him a fortune teller. Where are they today? They're scattered to the four winds of the world. The temple has been burnt and they turned him down. Now, it is quite possible to do that at the end time. He says every generation. <coughs> you know, it, it makes me think tonight, a greater than Solomon is here. Have we made it just a religious thing? Or do we really recognize tonight who we are and who he is Amen. in our midst? I believe we do. Amen. Capernaum, the city of angels, we could talk a lot about this, but I, I don't want to get into that so much. We want to get back to our story but this is the setting that, that he walks into. Here at the end time, we see the same thing again. There's great signs and wonders taking place in our day. Pentecostal revivals and all great, great signs and, and things taking place. Why? Why? Because God was going to reveal himself in flesh again. Amen? The same thing again. There are signs and wonders. Discernment. The sign of the word made flesh. Healings. God crossing the sea to be amongst his people. Ever, even after all the signs and wonders, what did they do? They still rejected him. Amen? Now let's look at Jairus here in our story. Jairus would have been the ruler of one of those synagogues, one of the great synagogues. He was a, a great man of great renown and, and a ruler of his, uh, of his people there, meaning that he understood the scriptures. You know, if you, if you look at this man, he understood the word. He uh, he had read the, the books of Moses and he understood the, the things that they were looking for in their day and the Messiah and the coming of the Messiah. And so he understood all those scriptures. He knew what was supposed to take place. 
He was a high priest. He, he knew the law also very well. And this is very important as we go into our story that you have this man, Jairus, who has a need in his home, but he also understands the law. The law was very important to them. You know, they had all their traditions and the laws. And, 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 and so you have this high priest who's going to be in the story who understands those things very clearly. And then you have this Redeemer, Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world, also coming onto the scene. You're going to have the representation of the law and you're going to have the representation of grace meeting in the story. But he was conflicted because, we're talking about Jairus now, because who was this that was coming on the scene? He had a need in his home, and yet he knew that this person, maybe he didn't understand him all that well just yet, but he knew that this person, that wherever he went, miracles was following him. And whatever that law had, was that he had, it could not do what he needed for his child in his house. The law could offer him nothing. When it came to the needs that were in his home, the do's and don'ts, the legalism, those things could do nothing for him when it came to the needs of his home. So very interesting people that we see coming onto the scene here tonight. Even though he might not have been allowed to mix with Jesus, he still had a need. How many has a need tonight? Amen? And here's a man who, who had a great need. And the Bible, I think it's so amazing, the wording. If you go back and just read it, just take your time and, and read through every line of, of the Scripture there. But he refers to her as my little daughter. It's an endearing phrase. My little daughter. Right? When you, when you hear that, it, it pulls on your heartstrings. Yeah. This little child is in need and... He meets Jesus Christ and he says, my little daughter. So we see that he, his only daughter, we find out later on in those scriptures there, is 12 years old. And you'll see how this is also important later on. But notice the relationship here. This was his daughter. So Jairus has a daughter, just to be clear. Jairus has a daughter. She's 12 years old. And he calls her my little daughter. So he is a father figure to his daughter. Amen? As a father, he knew that he needed to get to Jesus because he was the one in his home that maybe had access or knew where to go. And so he was the one who was able to do the right thing for his family because he's in a position in his home where he, he can provide, where he can protect. Amen? Where he's accountable. Right? So fathers have that responsibility in their homes. <coughs> but notice, because I'll give you a little hint here, a little preview, Jesus Christ also is a father. So here you have Jairus, a father, who is tied to the law, and then you have this, this Jesus Christ, who's also a father figure. Amen to all of us. He's our heavenly father. And what, is, what happens here is he is the, he's the one that's going to bring grace. Speaking about two different headships, basically. You have a headship that is governed by the law, and you have a headship that is governed by love and by grace. Oh, my. Amen. Which one do you want to be under tonight? Huh? You can imagine what that 12-year-old little girl was thinking when maybe the daddy said to her, I'm going to go find this Jesus. You just wait. And maybe that little girl was thinking of her daddy and trying to maybe think of what is, what is this, who is this Jesus? Does he have a little girl? Does he have a family? Would he understand what is going on in Jairus' house? Oh, my. Now I'm trying to show you how God thinks and how he, how he understands. Amen. He, he sees all the little details. Amen. So Jairus approaches him. And remember, Jairus has enough faith there to ask for Jesus to come to his house. If you come and, and heal my daughter, because at this stage she was just sick still. So he implores Jesus to come, and, and Jesus goes with him. And I want to show you also, Jesus knew where Jairus came from. He knew he came from the synagogue. Amen? He was from that, that place that was going to reject him. But, you know, look at Jesus here, and I think it's a fine example for all of us. 
how that Jesus was willing to go with Jairus anyway. Why? Because there was a bigger picture. Someone's life was on the line. Amen? So, someone was in need. And so they were willing. And that's why the prayer meetings are so important, my brother and sister. That's the most powerful weapon given unto the church. Amen? It's the most important service of the week, the prophet says. And what, what is that? That is, our, that is where we can, we can stand in the gap for one another because there's a soul that is in need. So Jesus was willing to go with Jairus. I love that, that Jesus would be willing to go with him to his house. Two different worlds meeting here. Jesus was willing to go with him. And as, as they're going along, no doubt, here's this important man from the city. And then here's Jesus Christ who's just been performing all these miracles. No doubt that crowds start to gather. And you can, you can go read about how Brother Brandon talks about this story but the crowds start to press in around him. In other words, it was crowded. You know, there was, it was hard to get around and, and it was hard to, to even know maybe where you were going. And, you know, it was, it was starting to get a little bit confusing and, 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 and congested. But the crowds are building around Jesus because there's an attraction around him. Everyone is pressing hard to get as close to him as possible. And remember, in the meantime, Jairus has a need. So Jairus, and this is very important, Jairus has a need to get him to the house to pray for his child who is sick. Amen. So when this crowd starts to gather, you can imagine how Jairus felt. This is going to slow things down, right? Why are all these people gathering when I need Jesus to come to my house? You know, there's going to be a delay now in, in my blessing. How many here has ever had to wait for a blessing from the Lord, Amen. right? <clears throat> there's a delay. Sometimes it's, it's a crowd. Sometimes it's things in our life. You know, it can be whatever. And it's sometimes you just have to, you know, uh, we, Jesus, we need to get going. <laughs> right? There's a rapture supposed to be coming, right? L Jesus, we need to be going. We, we have a need. I need, to, I need you to save my, my sibling. I need you to save my spouse. I need you to, to bring that promise to manifestation in my life. Let's get going on this. But the crowds seem to gather, it feels like. And Jesus is delayed because of the many that want to approach him. Now, we know he's not delayed like that in that sense, but it feels that way. It feels that way. Lord, why do you delay? He's getting anxious, maybe. You know, we need to get to the house. My daughter is in serious need. And I want you to notice, nowhere in the scriptures here, scriptures here do we find Jesus in a hurry. Yeah. We don't find him anxious or nervous. He knew that Jairus had a little daughter at home that was sick and she was going to die. Amen? He knows those things. He knew she was going to pass away. He was in no rush to get there before she died. Amen? Everything was under control. Even though it seemed like he was being delayed, he was in complete control. As the prophet says, God is behind every move. You know, we don't understand things, and Jairus probably doesn't understand. No, why are you stopping? You know, we need to get going. And I, I think of even what has happened this, this past weekend as we, as we said goodbye to Uncle Gideon. We don't understand, right? But in the meantime, God is behind every move. He's behind every move. He doesn't make any mistakes. He knows what he's doing. Just keep walking with him. Hmm. There's a certain woman that comes on the scene now. Now that we have the crowds gathering and we have all this, this press, as the Bible calls it, pressing in. And the certain woman comes in and now we find a big interruption. The whole plan where we thought we were at least getting him moving along, now we get a big interruption, right? It's like... You can imagine Jairus. I want you to just remember Jairus just as we go into the story. A certain woman comes on the scene and she's going to touch Jesus' garment and stop the whole process. Okay? And some of us in traffic, you know, we don't like to be hindered or, or delayed. You know the feeling. This is probably the feeling Jairus was feeling. She's going to touch his garment and stop him completely and delay him. But really, Jairus' faith was going to be put to the test here. And this woman, we know she had this, this issue of her blood. But notice here that for as long as the little girl has been alive, this woman has been suffering with the issue of blood. 
This is very important. These two women c connect in this scene here. For as long as this little girl has been alive, this woman has been suffering with the issue of blood. If that wasn't bad enough, this woman was an outcast. Suffered with this issue of blood, making her unclean for 12 years. Now, five minutes is a long time if you have to go and sit in a chair and you're told to be quiet and just sit there. Five minutes is a long time. A day is a long time. E you ever wait for a package to arrive to your house and they say it's going to be here on Tuesday and, you know, Tuesday comes and goes. You wait and it's, you know, these things are terrible, <laughs> right? Are you waiting for a promise? Are you waiting for God to do something in your life? She waited 12 years. That's as long as this little girl of Jairus had been alive. Why would God do that? Why would God orchestrate this whole event to make those two fit together so perfectly? <coughs> and like I said, if that wasn't bad enough, this woman is an outcast. Remember, Jairus is a representation of the law in the story. And he would represent the Levitical law, which going back to Leviticus 15 and 25, you're going to see these fives over and over in the story. We're in Mark 5 for the story. You find Leviticus 15, 25, and you're going to see later on this five again. It just, it's amazing how all these things connect. But it says here in verse 25, now this is what Jairus would be representing. He would know this very well, and he would be representing this portion of the law. And if a woman have an issue of her blood many days out of the time of her separation, or if it run beyond the time of her separation, all the days of the issue of her uncleanness shall be as the days of her separation. She shall be unclean. That's what the Bible says. Can you imagine living under that law? Every bed whereon she lieth, all the days of her issue shall be unto her as the bed of her separation. And whatsoever she sitteth upon shall be unclean as the uncleanness of her separation. And whosoever touches those things shall be unclean. And shall wash his clothes and bathe himself in water and be unclean until the evening. Now consider her, her situation for a moment. Just consider her just for a moment. Besides suffering this painful, weakening, physical condition, that all her money, she'd spent all her money on doctors, has, uh, they've not been able to cure it. After all that, she stays unclean because of the law. You know, it's, it's amazing because she didn't do anything to deserve that. It was just something that happened in her life. And the, her condition caused her to be separated from her family forever, for 12 years. F from her kids, if she had any, if she had a husband. They were not allowed to touch her. Otherwise, the law would make them unclean also. You talk about being isolated, unloved. <laughs> you ever feel that way? <laughs> For 12 years. And it's not because of anything she did. It's just the circumstances that she was dealing with put her in this kind of a situation. That's like us being born, sin and, uh, born in sin, shaped in iniquity. Amen. Coming to the world speaking lies. We're, we're put in this condition Amen. that separates us from God. But she was separated from her family. She couldn't touch things of her family. So if someone brought her a gift... Or she wanted to give somebody a gift that was, it was not possible. She had to be isolated from everything that would be comforting, that would be loving, that would be appreciative, that would be kind, that would be gentle. Interesting. But the Lord knew she was going to be there. He knew about her sufferings. He knew about her isolation. He knew about her, her problem. He knew about her weakness in her body. Can you imagine? By the law, though, she was considered unclean because of her situation. Under normal circumsta circumstances, she would stay away from people for during that time of the issue of her blood and then still wait seven days before coming back around her people. But her situation was way worse. She had to stay away for 12 years. 
and probably would have had to stay longer if the Lord did not come on the scene. <clears throat> she wouldn't be allowed to go into a worship service. She wouldn't be allowed to gather with the saints. I mean, just think about it. Alone, unwanted, unclean, unloved, untouchable, she was a ghost in her own community. She was severely judged and found insufficient and flawed. Are there any worse feelings for a woman to have? Now, there's a few differences between these women. We'll just cover them real quick here. One is a, one is a, a full-grown woman, and one is a 12-year-old girl. One suffered for a long time, being 12 years, and the other's life would be cut short, being only 12 years old. This young girl lived her 12 years in relationship with her parents and her community, obviously being involved and having a family that probably had people over lots and, you know, being in the synagogues and all that. And being allowed to, to come into the community and being al allowed to sit around the table with her parents and being able to, you know, have a relationship with her parents and have friends. So you have this little girl who is in the, in the prime of life, you know, just enjoying life and can, can enjoy all the things that the other woman cannot. And yet she was going to die. The interest, another interesting thing is that this woman touches Jesus and, and Jesus touches her, touches the little girl. So you'll see all the way through here, you're going to find all kinds of interesting things. She had suffered many things by doctors, as the Bible tells us. She had tried everything. She had spent all of her resources. Doctors even lying to her, cheating her out of her money. You don't know anybody like that, right? But she was not beyond Jesus Christ's capacity to heal or his concern for her. Amen. And it's important to note that she tried everything. It says so. She tried everything, spent everything she had. Isn't that amazing? We, like, spent all her resources for 12 years, done everything she possibly could have done, done every remedy, you know, done, went to every kind of doctor she could find, spent all the money she had to find a cure, and all it was going to take was one touch, one touch from the Lord. Now, to touch him, though, is a problem. This is the part we don't always remember about the story. For her to touch Jesus... Okay, remember, Jairus is taking Jesus to his house, right? So if she touches him, he becomes unclean, okay? According to the law. So if she touches him, he becomes unclean, then he can't go to Jairus' house. So if Jairus knew what was going on, <laughs> right? Think about this. This is very serious. She's not even allowed to come into a crowd, because everyone there suddenly becomes unclean. Everyone who touches her. And here she's obviously weaving through this crowd because it was pressing on Jesus. So she must have been touching just about everybody there, right? To try to get to Jesus. And if Jairus knew what was going on behind him or wherever she was coming from, right? He probably would have put a stop to it because, he's, because of the need he had in his home. See, the law was going to prevent himself from having a blessing. And he was a representative of that law. But God was going to show something. Amen. <laughs> oh my. So for her to touch him would be breaking that law. But she has to touch him. Just like Esther said, I know it's unlawful for me to go into the presence of the king. But a whole nation, all her people were, were depending on her doing the right thing. So she tries to do it secretly by just touching just a hem, just a piece of his garment. What was Jairus thinking? The, the Bible says that straightway the fountain of her blood was dried up and she felt in her body that she was healed of that plague. You can imagine after 12 years and weaving through that crowd and the commotion and everything that's going on and the implications or the consequences of her actions in that moment, and in that moment, something changed. Just touching the hem of his garment. In other words, something happened here. 
she, she didn't, she, she's always felt weak. Now Jesus was going to feel weak, yeah. right? But she's always the one feeling weak. She's always the one fe- feeling uh, undeserved, uh, undeserving and, and unwanted. But something was changing here. She immediately, just from touching Jesus, the hem of his garment, something changed. And she could feel it in her body. And she knew that the plague was gone. So what's happening? What's supposed to happen is she's supposed to be driven away from the crowd. And he's supposed to be unclean. Right? But that's not what happens. So what's happening? The law is being reversed. By touching Jesus. I don't know my brother and sister, but to me, that tells me that if, if, if I've got complexes, if I've got issues in my life, if I'm dealing with something in my life, I just need to touch him. He'll, he'll, the, the law will be reversed. Not just, you know, dealt with or tampered with or, okay, this is a one-time deal. No, it was reversed. The law stated that if she touched anyone, it would make them unclean. But something contrary to the law was happening now. Think of it. The Mosaic law is being reversed here in a moment. Rather than the Lord Jesus becoming unclean and being contaminated by her, she is healed and purified by the holy power of Jesus Christ. In other words, she couldn't make him unclean with her condition. You can bring your shame to him. You can bring your doubts, your fears. You can bring your hurts. You can bring all those things. You can't smear him. You can't hurt him in any way. This is who Jesus is. He's our redeemer. He's our healer. He's our comforter. Don't be afraid to touch him. Don't be afraid to reach out by faith. Amen? The hem of his garment... I did a little bit of uh, study on this just quickly, looking at the wording of, of the hem of his garment. When it says that she touched his clothes and, and that, 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 that wording in there and saying that she touched the hem of his garment, it is to say, when you go back to the book of Numbers now, 15, the Israelites were instructed to put tassels on the hems of their garments. Each tassel must include a blue thread. The blue was to symbolize God's divinity and His majesty. The tassels were to help them remember all the commandments of the Lord, that you may obey them and not prostitute yourself by going after the lusts of your own flesh and eye, your own hearts and eyes. The tassels were to remind them of God's holiness and His commands to them about holiness. Now the word for that, the hem of His garment, in the Hebrew there, It means wings. So she literally touched Jesus' wings to get her healing. Now, where does the mercy seat sit? Right under the cherubim's wings. In the shadow of his wings. Amen? Amen? Amen. You see what God was trying to show? Where the mercy seat was. (laughs) Amen. They're under the wings of the cherubims, the guards. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> David also says in the book of Psalms that he sought refuge under God's wings. And another very significant use for, the word, for that Hebrew word is in Malachi 4.2. A prophecy about the coming of the Lord that says, But for you who revere my name, the Son of Righteousness shall come will rise with healing in his wings. Oh my, what have we touched in our day? Didn't he say, I will restore all the years? (laughs) Oh my goodness. Now Jesus feels the impact of, of what's happening. He feels virtue going out from him, and he starts to look for this one that touched him. He says, who touched me? And the disciples question him, everyone is touching you. But this was a different kind of touch. Amen. It was by faith. 
So he starts to look for her, and she was trying to hide and hoping no one would notice, but Jesus wanted to declare her publicly clean. Amen. Okay, see, this was very important because she's still probably wondering, you know, this is amazing, I've been healed, I feel great, but she's supposed to have seven days at least still after this. Okay, and so it would still make Jesus uh, unclean. So, so there has to be a public declaration to reverse that law. Right, so Jesus is trying to find her, right, so that he can declare her publicly clean. That there's no sin, there's no worries here. You know, you're, you're free from guilt. You don't have to do anything. It's been reversed. Amen? It's like you never had it. Right? She's trembling, not in weakness anymore, but because she has been in instantly healed. But she's trembling in reverence of this one who's changing her life. And this, to me, is the most profound thing that happens in the story. He turns around and he, and he sees her. And he calls her daughter. Okay? With a capital D. And he says, thy faith hath made thee whole. Watch what he's doing here. This is public now. Everyone can see what's happening here. You know, and Jairus is probably wondering, what's the holdup? <laughs> Right? Remember Jairus. Don't forget about poor Jairus. He also has a daughter. But now remember Jairus is the father. And here the heavenly father is standing there on the scene. And he calls someone daughter. What is he saying? He's saying, I know you. Amen. Amen. Because you'd have to come from him if you're going to be his child. Amen. Amen? Amen. You all know how this works, right? <laughs> Amen. <laughs> so he calls her daughter saying publicly that you belong to me Amen. where she had no parents maybe you know because she had been isolated and disconnected no love from anybody right here she now suddenly has a, a father Amen. can you imagine what this did for her in this moment so not only her, her touching brought healing to her but it also brings identification Amen. when he turns to speak to her he identifies her and he calls her daughter. One who had been the off-scour or the pushed aside one now suddenly had a family. A special family. Amen? Oh, my goodness. This is the first and only time Jesus calls anyone daughter. So this was deeper than just healing. This was about his relationship to her. Okay? Okay? By calling her daughter, he was saying that he is her father. As a father, what is his responsibilities? To provide for her. Amen? To protect her. To take up her case. Amen? That's our heavenly father tonight. Amen. He's saying, I will watch over you. I'm going to take care of you. You have a home. This woman apparently... <laughs> has a champion now, someone to fight her case, plead her cause, a refuge, a place of safety. Amen. Oh, my goodness. He wanted to make sure she realizes what was happening, so he says it publicly. He has become her champion. She is now under his care and protection, and he will claim her as his own. Now, remember, Jairus is standing there, He's also a father. And something probably tells him if he cares that much about his daughter, how much more does he care about my daughter? Amen. And he's watching the proceedings and he's watching all these things. And Jesus, no doubt, knows that this is speaking to Jairus. It probably brings a certain peace maybe to Jairus that it's going to be okay. Because if he cares about his daughter that much, surely he cares about my daughter. Amen. What about your family? What about you tonight? <laughs> Jesus was showing Jairus that he understands the situation. He understands what it means to be a father and to have a daughter. He understands it. <clears throat> now, this is interesting how this st story turns here. It may have seemed like an interruption to Jairus at this time. But God had a plan in all of this. 
He had a purpose in all of this. God's timing is absolutely perfect. And Jairus is probably standing there, you know, and this, he's waiting for the promise for his daughter to come to pass and for healing to take place. And so he's probably still thinking about his daughter being healed. But a messenger comes from the house. So when things are looking bad or, you know, things look like, you know, man, when's he ever going to get to my need or, you know, whatever, it gets even worse. At the time, a messenger now shows up on the scene from Jairus' house. Sad news. So during this delay, the words come that your daughter is dead. Why troublest thou the master any further? I mean, it's like there's nothing more to be done. It's over. It's impossible now. Don't bother Jesus. Don't bother him. Like Peter who had fished all night, he knew there was nothing down there. And then Jesus tells him to put his net down. I know there's nothing down there, but Lord, at your word. <laughs> right? Now Jairus is in a, you know, everything has now sped up. Everything has changed. Why trouble thou the master any further? So in the mind of this messenger, death meant the end of Jesus' ability to help. But God's plans are not our plans. His purpose will be accomplished. Nothing will hinder the plan of God, not even death. So do not be afraid. Isn't that what he said? Amen. Don't be afraid. Only believe. Now, Jairus' name means God has enlightened. So you see what's happening with Jairus at this time. God is giving him revelation of who he is. Jairus is receiving revelation by watching all this unfolding, being enlightened from the event. He sees that this one has power to heal. And then he hears about this messenger coming and saying, well, it's gone from healing to death. But there's revelation coming to Jairus. Even when all seems lost, he instructs Jairus now, just believe. When it's all seems lost, when it seems impossible, just keep believing, keep having faith in God. Why? Because all things are possible to them that believe, and nothing is impossible with God. Amen. Now, in the meantime, you know, back at the house, they had hired mourners. I don't know if you've ever heard of this. You can hire wailers or mourners, right, at funerals. And they come, and their job is to make it a funeral, <laughs> Right? To make sure people are crying and getting the emotions worked up. Just to make sure there's nothing left <laughs> after, right? So that's what they've done. They've hired mourners. I mean, the, the scene at the house is not just, you know, she's just passed away and they're just, you know, getting used to the news. No, they've gone as far as to hire the mourners. You know, they, they, everything is over. You know, they, they've already gone into the process of, of, of being separated from their daughter and that uh, this is it. It's over, right? And you can imagine coming onto the scene, if you were going to pray for someone or if you were going to express faith in something and you've got these mourners yelling and crying in your head. It's kind of how it feels sometimes. You know, we, we get a doctor's report and he says, you know, you got cancer or you got something. I appreciated that testimony tonight. We just had a, a sister also healed from cancer three times this year. Amen. So God's still healing. Amen. <laughs> But, you know, you, you, you get a doctor's report and it's, it screams so loud, amen, that your faith doesn't have a chance to think, right? This is the kind of scene that they're coming into. And Jesus gets to the house, the place is full of mourners. They remind Jesus, she's dead. Don't, don't worry about it. It's, it's over. And he says, why make ye this ado and weep? The damsel's not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed him. They laughed at him. So not only, you know, are they mourning and all this stuff. Now when he tries to give them some faith, they start laughing at him. Like, this is crazy. You're crazy, right? These guys were professional mourners. <laughs> We've seen death before. There's no, you know, it's just leave. We got this, <laughs> right? That's how it is, right? You know, we, we get, a, we get a, a sickness or something and we... We deal with it for so long and we go, well, that's just maybe the new normal for me. Get diabetes or 
that's the new normal. You know, the mourners have already decided. It's, it's you know, it's just the way it's going to be, right? But no, there's something on the inside that says there's more. He's, he's my maker. You know, he's the resurrection and the life. He, he's the God of the impossible. Amen. We don't have to put up with any of those things. Why not touch him? Why not have faith in him? Amen. Amen. They didn't know who was standing in their midst, obviously. And so what does Jesus do? He calls her forth, the 12-year-old little girl. The same voice that called Lazarus out of the grave took her hand and calls her up. We're told in Numbers 5 that touching dead bodies defiles a living person. So here, like I said, you've got Mark 5, Leviticus 15, Numbers 5. You know, so all these things. Now, now he's, again, he's touched a dead body, right? So now he's supposed to be unclean again just from touching the dead body. But you see, this is our God. He cannot be defiled. He cannot be affected by our condition. Amen. He is, he, his pardon is bigger than all those things. His love is greater. His blood is stronger tonight. Amen. There's nothing that can affect him or, or is going to make him shy away from dealing with your case. He's not worried about the law. He's dealt with that law once and for all. Don't have to beat ourselves up anymore. Just come into his presence. Amen. So he's not only proving here that he has authority over nature, as we saw earlier, and over demons and over sicknesses, but he has also authority over death. So what is the story we're closing now? What does the story of Jairus' daughter teach us tonight? The narrative provided there in Mark 5 demonstrates that while suffering can isolate and it can overwhelm us. Ever, ever feel like that? A certain circum circumstance comes up, an issue comes up, a family thing or whatever comes up, and you become isolated, and the, the feelings from that starts to overwhelm you. Something happens at work, or maybe you've got a sickness, whatever it is, or you're dealing with a complex or depression, and that thing seems to overwhelm you, and it isolates you, and you, it causes you to act different. You don't have the freedom to, to do and worship like you would like to worship. You know, you're, you're under a condemnation. You're under some sort of a legalistic thing. And it kind of seems to hold you there. It overwhelms you. What, what the story is telling us that even though we may feel overwhelmed or, or feel isolated, have faith in God. Have faith that He is real. And He is good. Amen. He is kind. And He's perfect in all His ways. And He's... His timing is just right. Amen. And He will provide both comfort and hope in times of trouble. So our faith tonight resides in the person of Jesus Christ. It doesn't reside in our plans. That woman, you can imagine for 12 years, planned her day, planned her life, plan tried all kinds of things. But you know, our faith doesn't reside in our plans, in our coping mechanisms, right? It resides in Jesus Christ. <coughs> Amen. Our time can be different from God's time. You know, we might feel that Uncle Gideon should not have passed away at this time. Our time is different than God's time, but his time is perfect. So trust in Jesus, not the crowd, not the feelings. Not in complexes, not in the obstacles. Trust in Jesus. Is that what the middle of the Bible tells us? I think the very middle verse in, this, in the scriptures is trust. It's better to trust in God than it is to trust in man. Amen. Amen? Trust in God. Let's stand tonight. The Bible says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In other words, your own plans or perceptions. In all your ways, acknowledge Him, and He will make straight your paths. In all your ways. Amen? So why number 12? That was when I was going through the story. Why 12? Why a woman dealing with an issue for 12 years, and why a 12-year-old girl? Well, you have to come to Canada to find out. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Why 12? Right? 
The meaning of 12 in the scripture is to be considered as a perfect number. It is symbolized, it symbolizes God's power and his authority. It symbolizes his government and his foundational strength. It can also symbolize completeness, like the nation of Israel, right? Twelve nations, 12,000 in each, sorry, 12 t tribes and 12,000 in each tribe, right? The 12 stones, everything's 12, 12, 12, right? It shows that Israel is a whole in a number 12. So it shows completeness, God's complete divine plan. 12. 12 princes, 12 tribes of Israel, 144,000, right? Each tribe having 12. 12 disciples to whom God gave all power and authority unto. The New Jerusalem contains 12 gates made of pearl. And the scripture's first recordings of Jesus' words occurs when he is 12 years old. Amen? Amen? 12. There's 12 zodiac constellations as well. So we see that the story, God was trying to point out something. He was trying to show that his, his, he is, He's got complete authority and power over every situation, in every situation. Whatever circumstances you're going through, He has complete authority and power. That's why you can stand like that little policeman, right, run out in the middle of a street, and all he has to do is hold his badge up, and, I, and he has authority. It's not because of how big he is. He has authority because of the government that's behind him. Amen. You, as the bride of Christ, we, as the bride of Christ, we have authority through Christ. Amen? Amen. 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 The prophet says this, the musicians can come. In the, in the message, the resurrection of Jairus' daughter... He says, see, and, and I've, I want to just, I want to leave this with you. So just listen real close. You know, no matter what you're going through, no matter what tomorrow holds, no matter what, what challenges you're facing, we're not free from challenges in Canada. You know, it is, it's the same everywhere. There's an incredible amount of pressure on everyone. And people are going crazy and insanity all around. <laughs> Amen. It's everywhere. But this really just rang true for me. The prophet says, see this? He says, fear not, only believe. He says, all things are possible to them that believe, no matter what the circumstance is, what Papa says, what Mama says, we're believing what God said. And the Bible says in Hebrews 13, 8, that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Is that right? Now he's saying that in the resurrection of, uh, in the message, the resurrection of Jairus' daughter. So he's telling us that he is the same tonight. Jairus' daughter was an impossible situation. You might have an impossible situation tonight. Lord, how are we going to fix this? How are we going to resolve this? How am I going to get my family back together? How, how is this going to play out? He's the God of the impossible. Amen. I happen to just believe that tonight. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Do you know that little song, um, The Potter's Hand? Beautiful Lord, wonderful Savior, I know for sure that all of my days are held in your hands. Crafted into your perfect plan. I think it's the key of G. You gently call me into your presence, guiding me by your Holy Spirit. <clears throat> Teach me, dear Lord. To live all my life through your eyes. I'm captured by your holy calling. Set me apart. I know you're drawing me to yourself. 
Lead me, Lord, I praise. <clears throat> so take me, mold me, use me, fill me. I give my life to the potter. Guide me, lead me, walk beside me. I give my life to the potter's hands. It says this, you gently call me into your presence, guiding me by your Holy Spirit. Teach me, dear Lord, to live all of my life through your eyes. Amen. And I love how it says in the chorus, take me, mold me, use me, and fill me. I give my life to the potter's hand. Call me, guide me, lead me, and walk beside me. I give my life to the potter's hands. Amen. How many here wants to give their lives to the potter's hands tonight? Man, if you have a need tonight, you could just lift your hand up this evening. He sees that hand. Amen. He saw Jairus' need. He saw that woman. He, he knew exactly what was going on. He knows all about you tonight. And whatever need you may have, if it's for family, if it's for a situation, if it's for healing, my brother and sister, have faith in God tonight. Just lift your hand to the Lord and say, Lord, remember me tonight. Remember the, the need in my heart this evening. You are the potter, I'm the clay. Let's bow our heads. Gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we, we close this little service tonight, Lord, and we just don't know how to, how to say, Lord, that we love you. Amen. Lord, the words, we, we cannot put the words together, Lord, enough in such a way, Lord, to, to bring the feeling that's in our heart, Lord, out, in, out from our lips, Lord. But we just want to say thank you, Lord. Lord, we love you tonight, Lord. We see, Lord, how much you care, and Lord, your kindness, your gentleness, your, Lord, your faithfulness, Lord, to those who are yours. Lord, and we see how you dealt with this woman, Lord, with this need in her body. Lord, and how you dealt with, with Jairus' need also. Lord, surely tonight, Lord, you see our needs. Yes. Lord, you see your little bride tonight, Lord. You see the hands that are lifted up, Lord, and you know all about it, O oh God. Lord, and you're probably saying, Lord, to each and every one of us tonight, Lord, that you are willing to go home with us. You're willing, oh God, to come home with us, Lord, and touch our children, touch our spouse, touch our lives, Lord Jesus. Bring healing and redemption. Bring restoration. Bring understanding. Bring peace. Bring comfort. Bring deliverance, oh God. So, Lord, we just lay our lives down before you, Lord. We we lay our loved ones, Lord, our, our cares, our needs. We lay them at your feet, Lord. You're the potter. We're the clay, Lord. We just want to rest in your hands tonight, Lord. Lord, ask that you would have your way with us. Lord, that you would extend your hand, Lord, and touch us also, Lord. Oh, Father, your one touch from the Master's hand tonight. Lord, that we can call you Father. That is how Jesus told us to pray. Our Father which art in heaven. Oh, God, we turn to you as our Father tonight, Lord. You're our provider this evening. You're our protector. Lord, you're our headship, Lord. Lord, you're our shelter. You're our refuge tonight, Lord God. Lord, you're our healing, Lord. You're our restorer, Lord God. You're our defender, Lord Jesus. You're our champion, Lord God. Lord, we have everything we have need of in you tonight, Lord. Lord, you provided for Abraham in his time of need, Lord. Lord, when there was nothing there, Lord, you created, Lord, a lamb for him, Father. Oh, God, you are the same tonight, Lord. Lord, change lives this evening, Lord. Change our, our families, change the atmosphere in our homes, Lord God. Let it be an atmosphere of faith, Lord Jesus. Oh, God, in this little church here tonight, 
I ask for your blessing upon it, Lord, for our brother Devet, Lord, and all that will happen here, Lord, every word that will be spoken, every action, O oh God, Lord, let it be pleasing unto you. O oh Lord, will you encourage these people? Lord, will you take them, Lord, tonight and let them know, Lord, they have a heavenly Father who sees all things, knows all things, and cares about those that are his own, Lord. So, Father, we love you. We say thank you, Lord, tonight. We give you praise, Lord, for you are faithful. You are wonderful, Lord Jesus. Lord, we just commit our lives to you now. Commit this evening into your hands. We say thank you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 May the Lord richly bless you. Let me turn it over to our brother David, uh, brother Devet. Remember us in your prayers, and we just want to say thank you for your love, your support during this weekend, to the family, and to us. We just say God richly bless you. Thank you so much. Amen. Amen. Did you enjoy the word tonight? Amen. Amen. You know, just reflecting on some things that Brother, Brother Chris was saying, you know, that was one of the stories that the prophet liked to preach about the most, especially with a, with a divine healing line. You know, he always spoke about the, the woman with the blood issue. Amen. And so tonight I believe that God wants to also raise our faith and, and, and for us to understand that he's still in our midst here tonight, brothers and sisters. Amen. I want to I want to emphasize on what Brother Chris is saying. He is here tonight. Amen. We, if, if we don't believe it, then we might as well close the doors, go home, and, and, and enjoy your worldly life. But we need to understand and believe that God is here tonight. Amen. And I want to give you that opportunity tonight to, to really just reach out and touch Jesus. Amen. As we sing that song, touching Jesus is all that really matters. Then your life will never be the same. Amen. There is only one way to touch Him. Let's believe when He calls on your name. Amen. Touching Jesus is all that really matters. All in your life will never be the same. Oh, and there's only one way to touch Him. That's believe, oh, just believe, oh, when you call on His name, oh, and touching Jesus is all. would like us to sing that song only believe only believe all things are possible only believe amen it's just so beautiful when you think about it brothers and sisters there was a miracle that happened just before Jairus got to his daughter amen God used that woman amen that woman's miracle was a faith for Jairus to keep him on the road amen and it's so beautiful amen what has God done for you tonight amen can you can you testify tonight that God had done something for you by a raised hand amen can you say Lord I want to thank you tonight that you've given me a miracle in my life otherwise how are we going to make it brothers and sisters we are we are human flesh I mean we we just yeah going through life but what do we need we need miracles every now and again just to see us through amen and I think we can thank the Lord tonight for that Amen. And just remember, brothers and sisters, it wasn't Jairus that hired those mourners. <laughs> he wasn't there. Amen. Somebody else did it on his behalf. Amen. But he went there with the faith to know that the man that is here, he knew that the man that was with him is the man that can turn on the light in the darkest hour. Amen. And tonight I want to tell you, there is a man here that can turn on the light. Amen. And his name is Jesus Christ. Amen. Only believe, only believe, all things are possible. 
Love the Lord tonight? Amen. That was about 13% of you. Do you love the Lord tonight? Amen. He's good to us, brothers and sisters. Amen. He deserves the praise, the honor, and the glory. Amen. Brother Chris, God bless you, brother. Thank you for coming. And, uh, you know, just honoring the invitation. It means a lot to us. May the Lord be with you, even with your traveling down to Cape Town during this week. Let's pray for our brother for safe traveling mercies and also the services that he will be covering that side. Amen. We love you, brother. We appreciate you. Send our regards to your church and to the believers on that side. Amen. Though we are far away in distance, we are one body, brothers and sisters. Amen. Amen. And we thank the Lord for that. Amen. Brother Vainant, would you close and we'll pray for us tonight? Please, brother. And um, just remember the needs that's in our midst. And may the Lord be with you for the rest of this week and all the arrangements that you still have. Amen. Dear Father, it was a magnificent sermon. We are dead, we are bleeding in all possible ways, we are contaminated, and we dare not appear in the world, but we can touch the hem of your garment. Amen. We so love you for it, Lord. We came expecting, and you produced. Amen. We love you for it, dear Lord. Would you kindly go with us for the rest of the week? Bless us. Bless Brother Chris for having prepared to come speak to us tonight. Simple, teaching, brilliant. We absolutely adore you, dear Lord Jesus. Would you be with every one of us and bring us get together again on Sunday morning when we come to honor your resurrection. In the name of our dear Lord Jesus, amen. Amen. God bless you, brothers and sisters. Thank you for coming. May the Lord be with you. Just an announcement that Brother Owen Palm from Kimberley will, will be here on Sunday morning to take the, message, uh, the service. So Brother Owen Palm will be here Sunday morning uh, for those of you who would like to join us on Sunday morning. Amen. God bless you. Bless you. Amen. <laughs>